Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Gifford. I'm Ichiro Ueda, Vice President of Hokkaido University. Gift stands for a Global Issues Forum for Tomorrow, an event that was inaugurated uh, in 2011 and now in its third year. It's one of the flagship event, events of Sustainability Weeks, an event we have uh, hosted in 2007. The Sustainability Weeks is part of Hokkaido University's annual social contributions to help create a sustainable society. The, we host a variety of events, um, research meetings, uh, contests, uh, uh, exhibitions, and public lectures over a few weeks in autumn. 13 will feature 39 events and provide a platform for intensive talks on how uh, we can work to create a brighter future. The, uh, today's world has a variety of uh, uh, problems to be addressed. These are intricately interconnected. I believe education uh, needs to uh, equip people uh, with these three key attributes to solve these uh, complicated problems. First, uh, frontier spirits to lead the way forward to a new era. Second, expertise. And lastly, expropriations, that's, that's uh, uh, support ability to take actions toward uh, creating solutions. Hokkaido University uh, makes constant effort to develop future leaders uh, equipped with these attributes. These are our motives for holding gift, an event designed to guide uh, prospective leaders who are now high school and undergraduate students in choosing a field of specialization and research themes so that we can engage in collaboration uh, with us in the future to create a better world. Today, uh, six young researchers equipped with these three key attributes will talk about current and future uh, challenges facing uh, uh, the world and invite you to join their research. The first three will talk and discuss topics in the field of water management. Uh, they will also clarify key points in solutions to, to current and future challenges facing our planet's most vital resource. After the break, another three speakers will discuss issues relating to Japanese society. I believe their case studies in Japan can also provide significant insights and wisdom to other countries and regions in the world. This year, um, we really want you, uh, the audience, to engage in this events by posting questions on Twitter using a uh, hashtag shop HU underbar gift or uh, writing your questions down on forms provided. This is, after all, a forum for everyone to engage. Ladies and gentlemen, let us begin. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or should I say, boys and girls. Um, it's my great pleasure to re introduce my research area. Today, I'd like to talk about the wo global water issue, water shortage, and how membrane technology can save the world. Um, first of all, I'd like to briefly explain what the membrane is like. 
membrane that we use for water treatment or wastewater treatment is very similar to filter paper you used to use in experiment in your uh, junior high school or elementary school. But the, uh, the membrane that we use for water treatment or wastewater treatment is much tighter and much stronger. When we look at the surface of membrane with a large magnification, you see the uh, numerous numbers of tiny pores. And the principle of membrane separation is very simple. When you apply some driving force across membranes, such as a pressure difference, um, small constraint that is smaller than the tiny pores will penetrate into the uh, permeate side, whereas the large constraint that is larger than the micro pores will be suddenly retained. That's it. However, the size of the uh, tiny pores is incredibly small, say less than 0.1 micrometers. So we can very easily obtain very clear water with this simple operation. When we see the market nowadays, uh, we, have see, uh, we can see the uh, variety of the membranes. I think uh, you can very easily imagine these types of the flush sheet membranes, but the, uh, we also have string-shaped membranes like this. We call this hollow fiber membrane. This membrane is advantageous in terms of the uh, specific uh, surface area. We often use some organic polymers to produce these membranes. However, recently, um, inorganic ceramic membranes has also become popular. And the, as you can guess, um, structures of the membranes will certainly affect the membrane performance. Here you can see the uh, cross-section image of the membrane and the surface structure of the membrane. And one important topic here is that we have not optimized the uh, structures of the membranes. Nowadays, we can control the internal and the surface structure of the membranes, but we don't have any consensus uh, optimal structures of it. Additionally, um, we don't have any consensus uh, about the optimal material uh, for the production of membranes. We don't know whether uh, which is better, um, organic membranes or inorganic membranes. So my point is, um, now, still, um, production of membranes is a big frontier for researchers. Okay, so let me get back to the main story. Um, as you have heard, well, this century is called the century of water. Why? Now we are facing the uh, serious water shortage. You may not feel it if you live in a uh, water-rich country such as Japan. However, water shortage is really serious and now is recognized by the world leaders. You probably know the annual Davos meeting where world leaders get together and discuss important issues. And in the recent uh, Davos meetings, global water shortage has been a uh, very important topic. And in this year's Davos meetings, it was said that water scarcity is the second most important world risk. And some people caution that even a war may be caused by water shortage. And here you can see the uh, water scarcity index prepared by United Nations. In this slide, that color indicates the area where they are suffering from serious water shortage. As you can see, water shortage is really serious all over the world. And we sometimes or often forget the importance of water. We cannot imagine our life without water. And also, we need a huge amount of water for industry and agriculture. Unfortunately, however, there is no replacement for water. So, according to one pessimistic expectation, water may be become more variable than oils in the near future. So, understandably, we need to do something to address this global water shortage. And one viable option would be wastewater reclamation particularly wastewater reclamation and reuse aided by membrane technology. 
So that's why I would say membrane can save the world. And one extreme and advanced example of wastewater reclamation and reuse aided by membrane technology is seen in Singapore, where they are suffering from real, uh, serious water shortage. They are trying to use wastewater effluent as a part of drinking water source. Well, to make the uh, wastewater drinkable, of course, they need to use very advanced technology. Membrane can do that. And the uh, wastewater treatment, uh, wastewater treated by membrane is called their new water. And this terminology is very uh, important terminology um, among the researchers. Everybody knows it. And well, this new water is very important concept and the uh, membrane is the key technology for the uh, production of new water. And now, um, it, when it comes to the uh, you know, membrane, Japan is very strong. In the uh, membrane market, Japanese companies are dominant and even in Singapore, they use Japanese membranes. And Hokkaido University is one of the uh, well, most important research institutes for the uh, membrane technology. But here I need to confess, well, at present, water, wastewater reclamation using membranes has not become common. Why? Well, there is a problem in this technology, and this problem is actually my research topic, as I will explain later. Well, when it comes to the application of membrane to the uh, wastewater treatment, technology called membrane bioreactor, or MBR, is very promising technology. It has been drawing a lot of attention, and many researchers, including me, believe that this technology will be the uh, mainstream technology in the near future. And I think MBR can change the wastewater management system and eventually save the world. So from now, let me briefly explain uh, what is the uh, currently working wastewater management system. Well, now we are using the uh, centralized system. And the here in the centralized system, the, we installed a big large-scale wastewater treatment plant, and this large-scale wastewater treatment plant collects a huge amount of wastewater by using very complicated large-scale wastewater collection network. And then the, uh, it will discharge treated water into one point. This is the currently working wastewater management system. And as a result of using this centralized system, as we are seeing, in the real world, wastewater reclamation and reuse is not common. Why? Well, mainly because distance between demand and supply is widely separated. Treated wastewater is only available in the area um, that is close to the wastewater treatment plant. And additionally, I would say the quality of the treated water is not high enough. So application of the uh, treated wastewater is rather limited at present. Then, what would happen if we can change this centralized system into decentralized system? Um, each small community has their own treatment facility, and the quality of the treated water is very high. For example, that might be comparable to the uh, drinking water. Then, there is no reason to hesitate to use treated water, it is free. Then wastewater reclamation and reuse will be facilitated. So by this centralized system, we can have the decentralized system. Now question is, what kind of technology is necessary or suitable for this decentralized system? Treatment technology should be very compact and it should be easy to operate, automation is desirable, and it should produce the very high quality of treated water. MBR can perfectly meet these criteria. So by using MBR, we can have decentralized system, and we can promote wastewater reuse, and we can mitigate water shortage. Let me point out one additional thing, one additional advantage of this decentralized system 
well, with this kind of decentralized system, transportation of water is much cheaper and easier because the size of the wastewater collection system is very small. This means, um, this means installation of the uh, decentralized system can be very short. This is a very important aspect for the uh, developing countries where they need to quickly improve sanitary conditions. They cannot wait for a long time to install large-scale, complicated centralized system. But by using this kind of decentralized system, we can quickly install the wastewater management system and we can quickly improve sanitary conditions in developing countries. So, um, by using MBR and the decentralized system, we can improve the uh, sanitary condition and, well, in this sense as well, we can save the world. In spite of the uh, advantages I have just described, where well, I need to say, the use of MBR has been still limited, and decentralized wastewater management systems are still in the uh, minority. Why? There is a problem in this technology. Um, as you can imagine, probably, in the uh, long-term operation of a membrane process, including MBR, some component will accumulate on and in membranes, and permeability of membrane will be reduced. This phenomena is membrane fouling. Membrane fouling will increase both operational and initial cost. So this limits the wide ap application of membrane technology. So for widespread use of MBR technologies, we need to address this problem caused by membrane fouling, and therefore, understandably, Membrane fouling is very important and hot research topic. To control membrane fouling, we need to know what fouls the membrane. Many researchers have investigated this topic, and uh, we have a kind of consensus that, well, when it comes to the uh, uh, membrane fouling in MBR, some polysaccharides or proteins are the major players in membrane fouling but there is very limited information on detailed features of polysaccharides or proteins. We don't know what types of proteins or polysaccharides are involved in the uh, membrane fouling in MBR. So this is a problem. And well, um, when it comes to the analysis of proteins or polysaccharides causing membrane fouling in MBR, I think Hokkaido University is one of the uh, leading Research Institute. Um, one big advantage, or I would say one beautiful thing in Hokkaido, uh, working for Hokkaido University, is that this university is a very big university. So I could find researchers who are really good at analysis of polysaccharides or protein. And we did a kind of collaboration, and with the help of these professors, we could reveal the detailed information of polysaccharides or proteins causing membrane fouling in MBR. Well, I think this is the, uh, probably the first report in the world. And I think by accumulating this kind of very detailed information on polysaccharides or proteins causing membrane fouling in MBRs, uh, we will be able to develop new method to control membrane fouling in the future and we can promote the widespread use of membrane technology. So, as I have described, membrane can save the world, I think, by mitigating water shortage and the improving sanitary condition in developing countries. Well, this research area is very competitive, but the, uh, I think it's very exciting to compete with the researchers from all over the world. So, I highly encourage you to join us and the, uh, do research together. And Let's save the world. That's it. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today, I would like to talk to you about the ocean. The ocean that we all know 
the ocean that we all love, and the ocean that through our actions is becoming endangered, not just the ocean, but the life that lives there, and uh, that we may be losing at a very fast rate. So what's the trouble with the oceans and what are we doing concerning that? If all the world were paper and all the sea were ink, if all the trees were bread and cheese, what would we do for a drink? This is just from a child's bedtime song, but it tells you how important oceans are for us. And water is the most, together with air, is the most important component of Earth. Oceans uh, occupy over 70% of Earth's surface and hold over 95% of all the water that exists in the world. And we just had a very nice talk about water. And we know how important it is water. Oceans were the birthplace of life. Oceans today hold, at least we know about, over 230,000 species, and we think that there may be 2 million or more. Uh, oceans produced, not oceans, but tiny organisms that live in on the oceans, produced most of the oxygen that we breathe, and today they continue keeping that supply going on. And we all know that without that, life on Earth wouldn't be possible. Oceans regulate our climates. You know, if you ne live near the sea or the ocean, you see that it's, the climate is more moderate. You don't have you know, so cold winters or so hot summers. But also, waters of the ocean carry from the tropics heat towards colder regions. For example, the Gulf Stream on the Northern Atlantic, we consider that the heat carried by the Gulf Stream from the polar area, from the tropical areas towards uh, the polar areas are probably one of the responsible for the development of our civilization. And of course, the economy. We all love nature, but we usually think more about ourselves. That's okay. So oceans are transportation means, oceans are communication means, oceans are sources of food. Indeed, one out of seven people that live on the world would not, without would not be able to live without the sources we collect from the ocean. Now, what's going on with the oceans? I told you at the beginning, they are being troubled, endangered by our actions. I just, I'm using a very simple um, model, so we all understand. Oceans are becoming like vinegar, and we all know what is vinegar. We use it in our, in our uh, kitchens for sauces and things like that. How is it going, how is it happening? CO2, we all have heard about CO2, we read about CO2 on newspapers, and we see that on TV and radio. CO2 is going out from our cars, our houses, our industries, our planes, our ships, and accumulates in the atmosphere. Then, dissolves in the water of the ocean, and by combining with the, that water, becomes an acid, becomes, becomes the so-called carbonic acid. And this acid, is uh, acting with carbonate. Our bones, for example, are made of calcium carbonate. Most of bones, shells of the animals, spines of sea urchins, etc., etc., are made of calcium carbonate. So this acts with it and starts dissolving. Let's just give you a little example of what is happening to the animals in the sea. You, maybe some of you did it at school, I did it when I was your age. But if you didn't, you can get home and do it. Just use some of the vinegar you have, have it on a glass, for example, and drop some eggshell. You can also do that with a small bone. And we'll see, if you leave it for a certain time on the vinegar, you see that the eggshell starts to become very fragile. If you could see it under the microscope, you'll see that small holes appear on it. And step by step, those small ho holes increase, and with time, the eggshell will just dissolve in the vinegar. 
exactly the same is happening with animal bones and spines and skeletons and shells in the ocean. Now, is science doing something about it? Is society and governments doing something about it? We first knew about it, when we talk about we, I mean science, around the year 2000 when, because of the CO2 accumulating in the atmosphere, governments were thinking, of, well, maybe we can just dump it into the ocean and get rid of it. And then scientists started doing experiments. They started enriching seawater in laboratories with CO2 and looking what happened to those animals and plants that lived in there. And they noticed that skeletons started to dissolve, reproduction started to you know, be late or be stopped even, growth started to decrease, and that's when all of this question about the so-called ocean acidification started to come on. People like me, here at Hokkaido and in many other places, we work with sea animals. In this case, it's uh, 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 bryozoan, kokemuchi in Japanese. It's, it's an animal, a colony, that looks like a plant, as you see there. It has a skeleton made out of calcium carbonate, exactly like my skeleton, exactly like your skeleton, exactly like the eggshell. So what I do is that I put these animals in the lab in bottles enriched with CO2, and I see what happens. What happens to their growth? And what happens to their growth is that with time, growth decreases and even stops. And what about the skeleton? Well, the above picture is a normal skeleton. And you look at what happens to the below picture. Skeleton starts to dissolve. But reproduction also stops in many cases, and physiology and a few other. These are just the more evident results that we are obtaining. The other thing that we do is that we use collections. When you, whenever you go to a museum and you see a beautiful exhibit there, think that that material of the exhibit is used by scientists to compare what was before, because those collections may, maybe have 100 years or 200 years, sometimes more. So you can collect, you can compare those animals, those plants, with what you have today. And you can see those changes happening. Let's talk a little about Japan. We are here in Sapporo, a beautiful city. Well, Japanese waters, oceans surrounding Japanese islands, hold almost 15% of all the diversity in the oceans. This makes up a little over of 33,000 species that are here. So it's a big responsibility. Now, is Japanese society, Japanese government doing something about ocean acidification? Yes, it is. Quite a lot, as a matter of fact. One of the things that you can have access to it and you can see the, the, the state of the art, so to speak, of ocean acidification, it's this uh, Japanese Meteorological Society website, which records all the progress of ocean acidification, not just surrounding Japan, but also in other parts of the world. Graphs like this, for example, you can see there. For example, you see that one way we measure ocean acidification is through the so-called pH. And pH varies between 1 and 14, being that 1 is the most acidic and 14 is not acidic at all. So if you look there, you have the pH, and you have years from 1980 through 2010. And you see those graphs, you see how pH is decreasing, which means if pH is decreasing, acidity is increasing. Remember, as low pH, as higher acidity. And then on, the, on, the, on the, your, your left side, uh, you have an also a transect of the Key Peninsula. In the Key Peninsula, on the last 26 years of measurements, we noticed that acidification had increased by 0.04. Well, you say, well, 0.04 is nothing. It is something, because during the last 200 years, acidity increased by 0.1. Now, make the math, make the calculations. 200 years, 0.1. 26 years, 0.04. In the next 200 years, the acidification will be much higher than had been on the last 200 years. And that's one of the biggest problems, is the speed at which it goes. And that's why we think, and we are sure, as a matter of fact, that it's human 
action that is doing that. That's exactly. Another program that the Japanese government has and that I'm working on and is several projects, big projects, working on animals and plants and also developing tools. We need better tools in order to know better what is going on in the ocean. Searching for solutions. The Kyoto Protocol, I'm sure you all heard of it. It went in, in action in, 2000, in 2005. It will expire this year and there is no replacement. Governments in the world had not became to a solution to replace the Kyoto Protocol. Well, maybe Japanese uh, society that was one of the initiatives of the Kyoto Protocol maybe can take the lead and maybe should take the lead about this. Uh, and it's really important to have a replacement. Now, what about us? You know, the ones that are here, the ones that will maybe listen to this or are, you know, noticing about uh, through Twitter and other um, mechanisms. Can we do something? Yes, we can. We can always do something. First of all, we can use better the resources of the ocean. Second, maybe we can use bikes and walk instead of using the car, so it has less CO2 going to the atmosphere. Maybe we can heat a little less our houses. You know, I also like to be comfortable at house, at home. But still, think about all the CO2. Think that we are the future, and the ocean is here, was here, and we want it to be continuing here for the future generations. If we want to save it, all of us need to have our little grain of sand in order to have a big beach. In this case, a little drop of water in order to have a healthy ocean and all the life that lives in it. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk. And today I'd like to share some of my thoughts on how the scientists in my field can contribute to addressing issues concerning conservation of uh, biodiversity, especially in river systems. Okay, <laughs> as we all know by today, we are facing the fastest uh, rate of species extinction at the global scale in modern society or modern history. And the freshwater ecosystems, including rivers, are one of the most endangered types of ecosystems on the planet. Okay, this figure came from the US, and as you can see, a greater proportion of a species are facing a risk of extinction compared to other types of ecosystems, such as terrestrial ecosystems. Right? The reason is very simple. Okay, you can think of why the rivers are more sensitive to the human activities. They accumulate and they receive most of the impacts of or influences from the human activities that take place in upstream catchment areas, right? And uh, Japan is uh, also under great threat of biodiversity loss, and particularly because we have a high population density in such a small country at the global scale. So it is a great challenge for us to strike a good balance between the need of protecting nature and the need for development of land and also the prevention of disasters, right? So in this context, I am committed as a scientist to address three critical questions, right? The so first, we need to know why and how species diversity or endangered species matter to us? The answer to this question would provide us a good logical reasons to invest money and time for protecting them. Secondly, we also need to know the root causes of environmental uh, uh, degradation. So with the knowledge about what is causing degradation, the managers or we can do a better job to come up with ways to fix the problems effectively and efficiently. Right. And third, we also need to know where the remaining important ecological functions exist in our uh, society, world. Right. Ecological functions refers to the processes that are important 
in maintaining populations of particular species. That's what I mean here, right? With this information, we can uh, prioritize sites or locations that need to be conserved or protected with high priority. So we can do a better job in our conservation or protection of nature, right? <laughs> so, I'm sorry. So this is how we do our, our research. Um, I'll just give you time. Right. So reading rivers by which I mean understanding rivers, okay, uh, through the field-based observations. That requires us to feel what the target organisms feel or to see what the target organisms to see. That way we can better understand how the system works. Okay? And we also use almost anything that we believe would help us to read rivers, including not only fish, we also look at the bugs, insects, and plants, sediment, soil, and so on. And also a variety of uh, knowledge from different disciplines, including biology, uh, geomorphology, hydrology, hydraulics, will be very useful when reading rivers. So now I'd like to uh, introduce some uh, research results briefly, uh, corresponding to one, uh, one of each of uh, my critical questions. So firstly, I and my colleagues uh, tried to evaluate the cultural uh, benefits provided by rivers. So what we did is the, uh, we counted the number of people visiting uh, rivers for different purposes. Okay? And at the same time, we counted the number of species of fish in each river. We surveyed almost all large uh, river systems across our country, which was more than 100. And what we found is that uh, in rivers where we see uh, higher species richness of fish, the more people using those places for different recreational purposes, such as fishing or for just uh, having fun. Okay. What this tells us is that uh, there's a chance that if we lose a species richness, then there's a risk that we're going to lose some uh, cultural benefits we receive from river systems. Right. So talking about the second example, this is about uh, freshwater mussels. Um, these mussels are one of the most endangered groups of organisms on the planet for many reasons. And the managers and we are very much concerned about how we can protect their habitat and how we can restore their habitat. But unfortunately, throughout the world, including Japan, uh, their habitat is shrinking substantially. And this is the um, one of the okay the um, typical habitat in Japan. What do you think about this river? Well, it has a green vegetation along water course, and the water quality is not very bad, but the habitat is shrinking. Well, we try to find out what's going on in this river, and we required we 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 had to go back to the the uh, condition in the past. So we have to look back the past condition to find out what was wrong with this river. So over the period of about 30 or 40 years, uh, the landscape level appearance changed substantially. Okay. Basically, we have more vegetation uh, now compared to the past condition, which may sound good to you, but it's not. Right. <laughs> the other way of looking at reading this river was looking at the topography of riverbed, okay, which cannot be easily seen from the ground. You have to go under the water. And what, what we found is the, uh, there's an unusual rate of erosion going on underwater, which cannot be explained by any natural processes. Okay. And this was about like 20 meters deep, which cannot happen in nature. So then putting all this information together, we came up with the uh, conceptual model and, uh, and also the scientific uh, uh, rigorous analysis. We concluded that um, construction of, of dams and also the abstraction, extraction of uh, sediments uh, from river channel in upstream area 
was the cause, main cause of the ecosystem degradation in downstream areas, right? <laughs> so with this kind of information, we and river managers now at least know what is causing the degradation. So there's a clue for what they can do to uh, restore or conserve or protect their habitat, right? So third example, this is about uh, commercially valuable uh, species, salmon. Right, this is the life history of this salmon, okay? They uh, hatch from the egg in rivers, and then they migrate down to the ocean. And after spending several years in ocean, they come back to lay their eggs again. This is their life cycle. Incubation period of eggs is critical for their uh, um, life cycle. And uh, water environment having a particular temperature is critical for their successful development. Right. So by the end of this, I mean, uh, by doing this uh, research, what we found is the simply saying there's a places where we receive a lot of we or salmon, yeah, they receive a lot of influences from groundwater coming up from the riverbed, right? So this is where we did survey. Uh, Toyohiro River, you're familiar with this? And the Toyohiro River flows through the center of our Sapporo city, where nearly two million people live. So you can imagine how much human influences this river can uh, receive. But amazingly, in some locations, uh, this river is still receiving a substantial amount of groundwater dis recharge from the riverbed, which again cannot be see, seen by just you know from by looking at the river from the ground. And this water coming from these locations are very unique, and they are different in terms of water uh, chemistry and also temperature regime compared to the stream water. And then what we found is the, the locations where the salmon, they spawn, they lay eggs in cold winter period uh, match exactly uh, with the locations of these groundwater uh, places. Okay. So which uh, s tells us that, okay, conservation of the groundwater system that provides a good habitat for salmon is very much uh, important, critically important probably for maintaining their winter population. <laughs> so here's another important message from me. Uh, publishing papers is a necessity to survive as a scientist, as our pr uh, professors told me repeatedly in the past. But I am uh, increasingly recognize the importance of practicing our cutting edge uh, information, scientific knowledge to the public. Right? <laughs> so there are many ways. But one way of doing that is providing environmental education to the public. Okay? That way we can teach what is going on in our surrounding environment very uh, effectively. So in my lab at least, I urge most of my graduate students to participate in those kind of activities as much as possible and share the knowledge with the general public. In conclusion, I'd like to stress three uh, points. Uh, regarding the, the management of river systems for future, right? First of all, we should respect uh, nature. The nature, rivers, they know how they can su support a variety of uh, organisms. So we should set up the system in which rivers can do what they want to do as much as possible. And also secondly, uh, protecting, conserving everything is impossible and impractical. So we should prioritize our choice. So try to find out what is important compared to the others so we can do a better job. And at the end, <coughs> science can help us. Okay? There's a still large gap in our knowledge about the, how the river system works. So that needs to be filled up. So we need to continue, carry on our research. So if you are interested in doing this kind of work, I welcome you all warmly uh, to join our uh, team at the Hokkaido University. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back to GIFT. Um, I would like to explain that the, the older speakers you are uh, about here will be teaching on a brand new uh, modern Japanese studies program, which is beginning next year on October uh, as foundation. The first year intake for the degree is due to commence the following spring semester 2015. We are very excited about this program. Being the first of its kind in Japan, it is bachelor's degree program, expands four years, and offers so much. The first, intensive study of the Japanese language. The students should be completely uh, fluent uh, on graduation. Second, the study of Japan in four main disciplines, uh, history, culture studies, sociology, and political economy. Third, court learning with Japanese students. Uh, students will take many classes uh, uh, with their Japanese peers. Fourth, the curriculum that allows students to discover their Japan from the unique and multicultural vantage point of this great island of Hokkaido. We cannot wait to uh, begin this brand new program and welcome the best and brightest students uh, into the first intake. Well, uh, with that, uh, uh, let us begin gift. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for coming today and for staying for the second session. My name is Emma Cook. I'm a social anthropologist uh, now in the International Center. So my talk today is titled Crita Creating Unsustainable Lives, Effects of Gender Norms on Male Fritas. Okay, so in the past 20 years, we've seen a significant increase in irregular work, irregular work conditions in Japan. So for example, um, we now know that as of 2012, 38.2% of workers are in the irregular employment sector. Now this is a, a significant increase. Um, it's actually labelled the feminization of labour and is something that is happening around the world in post-industrial countries, not just in Japan. So what we see, um, although it's called the feminization of labour, uh, part of the reason why it's called this is because of the increase in male workers in what has traditionally been a very female-dominated sector. So since 1990, we see that uh, male workers in this kind of sector were at only about 9%. And as of 2012, 2013, it's now roughly 20% of men in this kind of work. Okay, so my research specifically, um, it's anthropological research, it, it deals with ethnographic methods, and it really focuses on uh, a topic of worker called Frita. Now, a Frita, at its simplest, is someone who is aged 15 to 34, who is not a housewife, not a student, and is working part-time or in arubaito style jobs. Okay. Now, the term was created back in the 1980s at the height of the bubble economy. This was a time when jobs were very plentiful for young graduates. When the recession hit, when the bubble burst, companies really froze hiring of youth employment, of, of new graduates. And this led to an increase in university graduates as fritas. Now, after this, a moral panic happened, and now we can see that fritas are basically discussed in two main ways. They are either lazy, irresponsible slackers, or they are victims of the current employment system and of changing school-to-work transitions. Um, one of the things that is happening is, of course, they're part of the panic regarding pension and social welfare system. But recently, they've also been kind of called as a, as a point of concern regarding the fall in marriage rates. Okay? 
Uh, you can actually see on the graph behind me that uh, irregular workers tend to get married at a far lower rate than regular Seychellian employees. Okay. So, why? Well, of course, uh, financial considerations often come up as being one of the main reasons. We'll talk a little bit about this today. But behind that is actually um, very normative uh, ideas of gender that continue to construct um, employment in very gendered ways as well. Okay. So being a frita for a male particularly think is, is said to say something very negative about his character. So really my talk today focuses on, well, how do gendered role expectations affect these male fritas' abilities to create meaningful and sustainable livelihoods for themselves outside of the regular employment market? Um, just a note, um, all of my research on this has really taken place in Shizuoka Prefecture in Hamamatsu. It's a mid-sized industrial town, and it is a very conservative area of the country. So please do bear this in mind when I talk to you about my research findings on normative ideals of gender and how people are reacting. So in Hamamatsu, talking to both men and women, uh, people very much continue to aspire to post-war, post sorry, middle-class family ideals. Uh, well, what is this? Well, the idea of the breadwinner husband and the part-time working housewife. So, of course, with this idea being extremely strong, it became very important in my research to find out, well, what did women think of today's young men? What did women think of young male fritas? So let's go first to their ideas of today's young men. Well, overwhelmingly, this is what came up. Young men today are weak. Your why? So Akiko, who's 34, she said that they are mentally, emotionally weak. Seishin teki ni yowai. She said that when she gives them advice, they seem to get smaller. And for her, this, this is really representative of mental weakness. Ayumi talked about how young men today will quit jobs if they don't like them. And she compared men today to her father's generation who had no choice to do jobs because they were breadwinners. They didn't have the freedom to quit, she would say. And Saki, who is also 34, talked a lot about how young men today think it's okay not to gambaru, to do their best, or gaman, endure difficult situations. And again, so a lot of these comparisons were really between today's young men and their father's generation. Okay. So this brings me on to, well, what did they think of male fritas then? Well, overwhelmingly, it was very negative. And again, they are mentally and emotionally weak, says Sayuki. Um, I talked about how these young fritas, male fritas, are not doing things properly. They're not doing things chanto. If they quit jobs very easily, if they move around, then it's representative of how they're not able to do things properly. And Aya, a 30-year-old who was already married, talked a lot about how she would feel very embarrassed if she married a Frita, um, especially if she had to tell people that her husband was a Frita. Um, she talked a lot about how he would feel in inferior, hikeme, because she would be able to feed him and that this would cause significant problems in their relationship. So what did women want? Well, women in Hamamatsu tended to have quite a long list of things that they wanted. So the ideal partners were someone who was reliable, mentally, emotionally strong, of course, this came up, kind. This meant different things to different women. Older women talked about Men being breadwinners as a form of kindness. Younger women talked about kindness in a much more kind of typical young way of, you know, taking them out for dinners and being nice to them, yeah. Um, decisive. And decisive included not asking the women for advice. They wanted men to be able to make decisions when a decision needed to be made. They also wanted a guy to be communicative. So don't ask advice, but be communicative communicative. They wanted a man to be steady and trustworthy, and of course, responsible. And this included financial responsibility. Okay. 
So why? Why did women have this big long list? Why did women still want men to be breadwinners? Well, of course, there are definite financial and, and structural constraints in the labor market for women in Japan still. Women in Hamamatsu who were even highly educated with career track jobs generally expected to quit when they had their first child. And many said to me that their companies would expect them to quit when they had their first child. So, of course, this definitely affects what they want and need in a marital relationship. Now, interestingly, it was female fritas that were especially critical of the male counterparts. An example of、uh, Sumiko and Masao, who'd been together for six years.、Um, Sumiko basically talked a lot about how it was her dream to be a full time housewife and that it was not her responsibility to be a breadwinner. Masao, meanwhile, really felt that it would be okay for them both to keep working, plus, he didn't really want the pressure of being a breadwinner. But for, for Sumiko, this was off the table. So, of course, the pressure that male fritas receive is partly the result of women's economic position. It's partly the result of expectations. But it's not always about money. So, for example, Yoshio, a 33 year old high school dropout, was dating a woman five years his senior who was a career woman who intended to stay, stick with her job.、Um, but she refused to introduce him to her parents. Marriage was off the table because he was a frita. Again, this issue of embarrassment. So, women's expectations really influence the construction of masculinities and the continuation of gender norms. So, I've talked to you a lot about well, what, what do women want? Well, you know, what do male fritas think about marriage? What did they want about marriage? Nobu, a very talented artist who wanted to be an artist, really bemoaned the fact that he wouldn't be able to make enough money from art. Not only that, people stressed that it was not a sustainable livelihood. So he felt that with women's wages being lower, there was no way he could be an artist and marry at the same time. Takeshi, meanwhile, really did kind of. Feel that he should be the main breadwinner. He wanted that role. He felt it was a duty and an obligation of him. He wanted his wife only to work until they had children. So, of course, these men are also very invested in this ideal of men as breadwinners as well. Now, for some, this kind of pressure really pushed them to push away from marriage. And Hideo, a 34 year old, Basically, he talked about how he didn't want to always have to think about someone else. He didn't want these pressures. That's marriage, so it's not for me. And he's still unmarried at、uh, 39, 40 years old now. So, we have two issues coming up really on the gender divide. We've got male fritas who wanted to marry, but they were very worried about money.、Uh, they felt that they couldn't stay a frita and get married as well, they couldn't have their cake and eat it. Women, meanwhile, were not prepared to marry fritas because of money, but also because of the status of a frita. That working as a male frita says something very negative about his character. And so, despite the fact that the irregular labor market could be a place where people start to challenge and change gender role expectations, this is really not happening in places like Hamamatsu. Because both women and men continue to enforce these post war gender role expectations. And so I would like to invite all of you、uh, to consider not just the case of Hamamatsu, but in other places in Japan and elsewhere, how changing gender norms could help people create sustainable, meaningful lives for themselves outside of normative ideals of working. Thank you very much for your time today. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Philip Seaton. Today I'm going to be talking about、uh, tiger dramas and、uh, tourism. Has anybody ever visited a film location? Has anybody ever visited Universal Studios, Disneyland, or another place linked to film? If so, then you have been a film tourist, someone who has wholly or partially been influenced to visit a place、um, because of film. 
I am involved in a research project into content tourism. Now, this is a really exciting theoretical development that has been um, developed in Japan by um, Japanese scholars, and it's related to film tourism. Basically, content refers to the narratives, characters, locations, music, and other creative elements um, that appear in films. And content tourism is how these elements stimulate people to travel. But because this talk um, is being given as part of Sustainability Weeks, I want also want to think of content tourism in terms of its sustainability. Now, UNESCO defines uh, sustainable tourism as tourism that respects both local people and the traveler, cultural heritage, and the environment. But we can also think of sustainability in an economic sense. Is a tourism site related to film um, economically sustainable in the long run? Now, this gives a good example of the problem. This is a film location site in Yubari, in the center of Hokkaido. Um, it is the location for a film called The Yellow Handkerchief of Happiness, which was very popular when it came out in 1977. But how long can a, a site like this maintain its popularity once the popularity of the film um, has passed? But today I'm going to think about historical tourism as a form of sustainable content tourism. I'm going to do this by looking at a few TV dramas um, with historical characters and the tourism booms um, created by them. I'm going to be looking at two uh, tiger dramas, Shinsengumi broadcast in 2004 and Ryomaden broadcast in 2010. Now, these are flagship uh, historical dramas broadcast um, on NHK. They focus on a hero, a main character, um, and the dramas continue basically uh, for an entire year. These dramas typically trigger a large tourism boom to the locations featured in the drama. Now, this uh, graphic shows the extent of those tourism booms um, in the locations where dramas have been set uh, since 2003. Now, the two dramas that I'll be talking about today are in these two locations. And as you can see, there's a very significant economic impact in these places. Now, you'll notice that there's actually two figures um, listed there. The figures in the brackets um, are higher than the first figures, and that's because the Bank of Japan, who wrote these estimates, um, they were forced to revise upwards their estimates of the tourism boom based on the large number of people who were visiting, having seen the drama, presumably. Now, it's not only in terms of their economic impacts that these two dramas are a good comparison. Both are set in the Bakumatsu period. Bakumatsu is, is 1853 to um, 68. Um, they both have lots of locations um, in Kyoto, and they both uh, feature very popular heroes of this period. In Shinsengumi, uh, there was Hijikata Toshizo, um, who, as you can see from the photo there, is a, a sort of dashing figure of a, a samurai man um, and has lots of particularly female fans these days. And on the right, Sakamoto Ryoma, who is one of the great visionaries um, of this period. So let's go to our first um, location, Kyoto. In the 1860s, Kyoto was the scene of a violent power struggle between uh, the uh, defenders of the existing order, the Tokugawa shogunate, and those who wanted to overthrow the uh, shogunate and introduce a new era of modernization um, to Japan. Uh, Hijikata Toshizo was um, part of the Shinsengumi, which was a, a core created to protect the shogun on his trip to Kyoto in 1863. Meanwhile, Sakamoto Ryoma was one of the uh, shishi, the, the uh, men of high principles, as they were known, who were actively campaigning against the Tokugawa shogunate um, at this time in Kyoto. Now, this is the Ryozen Museum of History um, in Kyoto. And this is me being a typical drama tourist um, in Shinsengumi costume, having my photograph taken between a picture of Hijikata and Sakamoto Ryoma. Now, I show this picture mainly to illustrate um, that these two uh, historical figures are extremely important uh, characters in the context of this muse museum's exhibits, which helps to explain this data. 
These are the visitor numbers to the Ryozen Museum of History from 2000 up to 2011. Now, if you look in uh, 2004, you can see a very large increase in the number of visitors coinciding with the broadcast of the Shinsen Gumi drama. In 2010, we have a similar peak in tourist numbers um, that coincides with the broadcast of Ryomaden about Sakamoto. Notice also how in the year before the peak, there's a, there's a sort of lead-in, and that's because NHK announces the topic of his drama 18 months in advance, and then people who are interested in learning a bit more about the drama the following year, they will head to the museum. There's also a very steep drop-off um, in the year after um, the drama is broadcast, which shows that these dramas produce a very strong boost, but it's only a temporary boost to the tourism industry. It's not only at this museum that we've been able to see this kind of pattern. At the Mibudera Temple in Kyoto, which was the base uh, for the Shinsengumi in the early 1860s and which contains the graves of a number of uh, Shinsengumi members, I asked the staff um, about the tourist levels um, in 2004. They said there were busloads of tourists. But then the following year, the buses stopped coming and visitor levels returned to normal. Let's now move away from Kyoto and go to Hino. Um, this is in uh, Tokyo, it's in uh, western Tokyo, and it's a very important site um, related to the uh, Shinsengumi. A number of the Shinsengumi members came from this um, city, including Hijikata Toshizo. But there were a number of reasons why this particular site did not gain a large amount of, of uh, revenue um, or economic boost from the tourism boom. Let's have a look. Why? First of all, Hino is situated very close to the center of uh, Tokyo. It's within easy um, commute, uh, commuting distance. What this means in, in practical tourism terms is that the city was not able to attract lots of overnight tourists. Overnight tourists are the key to a, a really vibrant um, tourism sector. People spend a lot more money when they stay the night in a hotel compared to when they're just on a day trip. A second reason is the type of sites that we find in, in uh, Hino. Uh, these are two um, small museums, the Hijikata Toshizo Museum and the Inoue Genzaburo Museum. Now, these uh, museums are both very significant for Shinsengumi fans because they're run by the descendants of the Shinsengumi members, but they're only open a few days a month and the entrance fee is, is very nominal, which means that these museums really aren't being run for any kind of um, uh, financial motives. It's, they're really about displaying family heirlooms. And here's the major uh, uh, museum in uh, Hino about the uh, Shinsengumi, the home of the Shinsengumi Historical Museum. But this particular museum was only opened in 2005, the year after uh, the drama was broadcast, so it wasn't able to take advantage um, of the drama. In any case, there would be negligible economic benefits um, for the city for this uh, particular museum. The reason um, is that it's had about 10,000 visitors per year um, since it's opened, and that's, uh, they're charging 200 yen in entrance fees. That's not enough to pay one full-time member of staff. What we effectively have in Hino is the local authorities subsidizing the tourism industry so that they can uh, generate um, a sense of local identity, um, history, and pride. So, I want to think about tiger drama br uh, booms within a sustainable tourism strategy. And this really leads me to five conclusions. The first is that stories and characters from Japanese history are often highly sustainable tourist resources, particularly in contrast to the uh, stories and narratives that we find in fictional film. Um, this is because the characters are an established part of Japanese history and culture, and so their stories keep on coming up again and again. Therefore, there, there are repeated booms as people go back to these sites again. But even when we do have these sites that can take advantage of existing booms, they should base their uh, business model on the visitor numbers in ordinary years. It's very risky to try and um, uh, build your business model using uh, peak year data. 
But at the same time, these uh, locations, they should be very ready to take advantage um, of any booms that do come their way. Um, they can really help to get the tourist site through the leaner years, as it were. Also, these locations should encourage their visitors to stay overnight. When you have people staying in hotels and buying dinner in the evening, that's when you can really start to make a, a large profit out of a tourism sector. But finally, um, contents tourism should be integrated into a broader tourism strategy. There are very few people who go to a location simply to visit a film tourism site. They typically like to have a more diverse um, experience. So the more that a, a, um, a location with prime historical contents can diversify its tourism industry, um, the better it is for that locality. There's a lot of attention these days on Japanese popular culture. The Japanese government has its Cool Japan strategy. But I'd like to fo focus um, on uh, contents tourism as one of the key growth areas um, for Japanese tourism in the coming years. And the reason for, um, uh, I think one of the results is going to be that when people visit Japan, they're going to be as interested in visiting a manga site or a history site as they are of going to a temple or uh, getting some local food. So. This is really one of the, the real growth areas in not only uh, academia, but also in terms of um, tourism strategy for the next uh, decade or two. And I will be continuing um, this research with colleagues of mine in the Center for Advanced Tourism Studies and elsewhere at Hokkaido University. And in particular, when people start uh, coming and studying on the Modern Japanese Studies program, I'll be really looking forward to hearing how our students go off around the country um, and visit sites related to their interests, uh, their contents interests. Thank you very much. I'm Susanne Klein, and I would like to uh, talk about uh, some um, emerging youth in contemporary Japan. I'd like to uh, open up with a statement um, that is, um, can you go back? I'm sorry, I pushed. Um, rather than working in a big company in the city, we've chosen to do a work that com contributes to the region and enjoy a life together with our local friends. Eat safe and delicious food, earn a stable income and live happily with our families, end of quote. So I'm going to talk about people uh, in their 20s and 30s who choose to relocate from urban areas to the countryside in search uh, for more purpose in life and a greater life quality. Depopulation uh, is actually the norm across uh, rural and small town municipalities in Japan, but recently, and this has been enforced by the Great East Japan Earthquake in 2011, um, people, some remote locations have actually attracted uh, young migrants. For example, there's a very famous case in Shimane Prefecture in Western Japan. Uh, we have a remote island called Ama Town, and uh, this um, place has only 2,400 residents, but has managed to attract more than 200 migrants, mostly in the 20s and 30s, from urban areas recently. We have uh, also similarly in Tokamachi City, in Niigata Prefecture, an influx of uh, young and quite well-educated uh, migrants um, in uh, recent years. And Ishinomaki City in Miyagi Prefecture, which is one of uh, the most badly afflicted um, areas uh, by the disaster in 2011, has had a record number of volunteers, some of who have decided to stay on or commute between Tokyo and Ishinomaki. There's a similar story going on in Likusen Takata city in Iwate prefecture. So you can see that uh, this phenomenon is happening all over Japan. So I'd like to talk uh, about lifestyle migration today. Um, that is migration that is uh, spurred by non-economic factors mostly. Uh, a characteristic of this uh, migration style is uh, ephemerality. That is, people are looking for a better life, um, a better work-life balance. Um, they, they're trying to uh, achieve non-material affluence and uh, a meaningful life in general. So uh, if they cannot achieve this um, boost in uh, life quality, they tend to move on to other places. 
Um, apart from that, uh, obviously self-realization and uh, the aim, uh, aspir aspiration for purpose in life, ikigai in Japanese, is quite a big factor here. So my uh, research project is qualitative in nature. Um, I usually um, refer to uh, interviews and participant observation, sanyo um, kansatsu in Japanese. Uh, that is basically I go out to places, um, talk to people, um, try to um, join in activities in order to get a sense of uh, what values and lifestyles people have. Um, this study focuses on migrants between 20 and 40 uh, in Shimane Prefecture, Niigata, Miyagi and Iwate Prefecture. And I focused on people between 20 and 40. Previous studies in lifestyle migration have uh, mostly focused on people after finishing work and retiring and moving to um, rural areas. So uh, the innovative um, feature of this study is first of all this age young age group and also um, I actually um, try to, you know, um, research people all across Japan. So uh, it's a, it's a quite a big sample. I've talked to um, 30 people uh, in depth now. So um, I'd like to share two uh, case studies with you to give you an insight why people choose to relocate. First, I'm going to talk about Abe Hiroshi, who is in his mid-30s, and he's a graduate from uh, the Department of Engineering, Kyoto University. He used to work for a well-known uh, car manufacturer in uh, Aichi Prefecture before deciding to abandon his conventional employment and uh, relocate to Ama Town, uh, the remote island I mentioned before. He has set up uh, a company with uh, a couple of other migrants in, in the 20s and 30s, uh, a group called Meguri Nova. Uh, and this group uh, is active in, uh, ma mainly in three areas, regional revitalization, um, education and media. So the idea is um, for the company to make a social contribution by boosting the local confidence uh, in the attractions and strong points uh, of uh, that island and hometown. But at the same time, they also hope to attract non-local migrants to the area, both as visitors but also as um, long-term migrants. And Abe's um, heightened sense of uh, life satisfaction can be seen from this statement. Quote, right now, I enjoy every day so much I cannot describe it. End of quote. Um, so although Abe has relocated to this remote island, he has been moving around um, both uh, in physical terms but also in virtual terms because he makes frequent trips um, throughout Japan to um, talk about his activities and network with other groups but also um, does he have a very strong um, presence on the internet using social media and um, uh, to share his experiences and um, uh, network with other people with sh uh, similar concerns. The second case um, I'd like to talk about here uh, is Tada Tomoyoshi, uh, who is a graduate also from Kyoto University, Faculty of Letters. Uh, he used to work uh, as a company employee in Osaka in uh, finance consulting for uh, several years. And then in 2008, the Lehman shock happened and he, s he decided to abandon conventional employment and move to Tokamachi City in Niigata Prefecture with his family. He's now doing something completely different. That is, uh, he's now engaging in organic farming and regional revitalization. So um, we can say that on the one hand, he's uh, engaging in manual labor uh, in a very classic sense, but at the same time, he also uh, has a very strong uh, inter uh, internet presence. Apart from his Facebook account, uh, he writes a regular blog about his uh, activities in the small mountain village uh, called Ikitani, where he has uh, moved to. And um, we could say that his lifestyle is actually going beyond the classic urban and rural divide. So he's moving around both in physical but also in a virtual, t a virtual um, dimension by using uh, social media a lot. So we can say there's an increased interest in the good life in Japanese contemporary society and this has been enforced by uh, the disaster in 2011. We also have a trend towards clusters and networks, that is people with similar values tend to get together and um, share their experiences. We also have lifestyles 
beyond the urban and rural divide. So people uh, tend to uh, move to and fro and there's no clear cut divide anymore. So we could actually talk about rural spaces in a novel manner that is previous research has focused on rural areas as an open category um, that is a place where you can uh, uh, engage in social experiments. Uh, there's also been the term a post-productivist countryside. So uh, you have countryside being assigned a new meaning after um, ma classical manual labor. And um, we also have the notion radical rurality. Personally, I would like to uh, call for an envisioning countryside not um, as a polarized opposite to urban areas, but I'd like to see it as a coexistence um, with urban areas because if you look at these um, cases of migrants, they are moving a lot uh, between spaces and there's no clear-cut division anymore. Another innovative feature of this study is that I bring in the concept of subjective well-being uh, into this lifestyle migration. So um, I'm obviously migrants uh, have their personal preferences and um, lifestyle choices that, um, have a, that have been a key factor in shaping the decision to relocate. But on the other hand, uh, the interpersonal uh, elements um, play a big role in uh, their well-being. So obviously uh, positive human relations, having a network with um, peers and other people makes a big difference apart from the physical and existential dimension of well-being. So, uh, and this brings us to the to this network network factor I've referred uh, to before. Uh, that is, uh, a lot of these migrants actually um, ha have kind of neo tribal elements getting together in informal networks. Um, they, sh they share accommodation, they share offices, uh, and they also engage in barter in order to make up for the lack of um, disposable cash because they abandoned um, previous conventional employment. Uh, so we uh, could say that contractual groups uh, in the classical um, meaning uh, such as companies have been replaced by effectual tribes and um, these are very, they tend to be very unstable and temporary in nature. And also they tend to be um, not bound by geography, that is people have um, nomad lifestyles and they also rely heavily on social media as I um, mentioned before. So I would like to uh, argue that f doing field work as a researcher with a variety of, of uh, people and in, and in a variety of places also constitutes a source of ikigai or purpose in life. Because in order to get um, valuable data, you obviously need to uh, establish a relation of trust with uh, interviewees. And this in, this in turn calls for intensive interaction with um, many various different actors. So this is a picture from a uh, field work I did with disaster volunteers in Dikus and Takata, Iwate Prefecture, uh, in the summer of 2012. I'd like to argue that well-being, subjective well-being, is made up of three factors. Good life quality, and this actually is a picture from uh, my favorite uh, restaurant in uh, Kesenuma, um, a, a Japanese fish restaurant. Uh, and uh, second, obviously, enthusiasm for work. That is, doing a work that you personally deem uh, meaningful. Uh, apart from, uh, and, and this obviously uh, exceeds uh, economic factors. And also, last but not least, positive human relations. So what is my, uh, mes my message to potential students now? I'd like to invite you to join us at Hokkaido University in doing fascinating field work in various regions across Japan. I personally believe that sustainable research requires human growth, and this you can achieve by interacting uh, with a variety of actors. I'd like to invite you to study at the most beautiful campus in Japan, but at the same time I'd like to encourage you to get out to other places beyond university, because I'd like to, to ask you to keep in mind that academia may be really inspiring and exciting, but it's only a very small part of this world. Thank you very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that concludes our gift for this year. And I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. And uh, we are looking forward to, uh, uh, we are uh, looking forward and waiting uh, for 
or for you to join us in your future. Uh, uh, I thank you again for coming, and we will see you next year at GIFT 2014.